Dr. Narnia here, and in this video, we're going to talk about language. So if we think about what is language, we use it every day. Uh, a lot of researchers would agree that language is used for multiple functions, and they're primarily used for the exchange of information between individuals. Now we can break language down into distinct parts. We could talk about phenomes. Uh, these are distinct sound units that uh, comprise language. We could talk about morphemes. This is the smallest units of language that contain meaning. We could talk about syntax. This is the rules or structure of language. Um, and if we kind of go a level above syntax, we could talk about meaning or semantics. Uh, what does the language actually mean? And then we can also talk about pragmatics. And this is the examination of how language is used in a particular context, right? So sometimes we don't always mean what we literally uh, say. Like if I, if you say to me, my teacher butchered my paper, that doesn't mean your teacher really murdered your paper, but that means they gave a lot of corrections. Or if I say, hey, what's up with you today? I don't think you're floating in the air. Uh, again, it's all about pragmatics. The other question we want to know as researchers is how do we process language in the brain? Now, in 1861, Paul Baroka examined a patient, Tan, and that was the only word he could speak freely. He has been unable to speak for 21 years up until that point. Now, Tan retained his ability to understand language so he could understand you, but his ability to produce produce language was severely impaired. After his death, Broca performed an autopsy and discovered that Tan had suffered brain damage. The left inferior region of the cortex, right, was damaged. And this was the first documented case of expressive aphasia. And we call this um, Broca's aphasia. Now, patients with damage to this region of their brain have speech typically characterized as slow, effortful, and halting, and it lacks uh, in some grammatical words, right? Think about articles or prepositions. Now, 15 years later, Carl uh, Wernicke, this is about 1874, uh, described a patient who apparently had the opposite problem. His patient had suffered damage to the posterior part of the temporal lobe, and it was described as having relatively fluent uh, syntactic uh, speech, so his syntax was, um, was intact, uh, but he had impaired comprehension. Now, patients with damage to this area exhibit similar uh, defects as someone who has what we call uh, Wernicke's aphasia. Now, this helped us kind of get an early distinction between language production and language comprehension which we'll talk about a little bit later in this video, how we have, again, two very distinct uh, areas of the brain that process language. And if you have a damage to this part of the brain, then you can have an aphasia, either Broca's aphasia, which is a deficit in language production, or Wernicke's aphasia, which is a deficit in listening or language comprehension. Now, how do we understand language? Now, someone's understanding of language, we, always, we usually call them the comprehender, is largely at the mercy of the language producer. The language, uh, well, the comprehender's job is to reconstruct the intended meaning of the speaker or the writer. Now, normally this process feels very easy, but when you consider the potential for ambiguity um, at nearly every level of representation, it's amazing we even understand language at all. So consider what you have to do to understand the sentence, the cat chased the rat. You must first identify the sounds or letters that make up the words. Then you have to retrieve the meaning. You have to build up the appropriate syntactic or structure, and you have to combine the information into an overall interpretation of the sentence. So in the next couple uh, slides here, we will talk about the sub areas of research related to language comprehension. As I mentioned to you all that we have to think about uh, the language perception or what we call co-articulation and that's an issue in language uh, comprehension due to the overlapping sounds in the spoken language so again this is how the the person perceives it and then there's also any the in uh, variance problem that's an issue in language 
uh, comprehension due to the variation how phenoms are produced. So again, this is on the uh, perceiver of the language. The other thing we have to note is our mental lexicon. And think of a lexicon is a uh, stored information of networks that represent multiple levels. Um, and we could think about certain words and think about what words are attached to them. So if you think about the word tree, what other things come to mind? Maybe fruit, maybe a bat, maybe a bird, maybe green, maybe bark. Uh, and then if you think bark, you might think dog. Again, this is a lexicon, a mental representation that we have of, of the words. The other thing we have to consider is not just the property of the word alone, but you also have to figure um, the context in which they occur, right? So we have to understand what context the word is put in, uh, and that way we can kind of understand what, what the person is saying to you, right? So if you said, uh, my teacher murdered my paper, Think about that context, right? Uh, you think about the teacher was probably grading it and they gave a bad grade. But again, so it's not just recognizing the words alone, but it's understanding the context behind it. And then we have to think about interpreting that sentence. Um, and we can think about it, the way we syntax, uh, they call it syntax uh, parsing. And we have to think about how the uh, sentence is understood. Right? So if you saw an example of an enraged cow injures farmer with ax, uh, if you think about that on the surface, you might think that the uh, uh, far, the cow was running around with an axe, right? If you're not really deep processing it, right? So you really have to think about the meaning and the, as opposed to the surface structures. Um, and, you know, you have to kind of give it some thought. Um, and we're really, as we're kind of interpreting sentences, we're inferring meaning, right? With the help of the syntactical structure of uh, the sentence. Then we have to think about how language is produced. And to produce a sentence like the cat chased the rat, we must first map the nonverbal concepts onto the ling linguistic representations, order the representations, and then articulate the language. So again, there's a lot of uh, processes involved when we just produce language. So again, we do all this effortlessly um, but, and we'll talk about how we learn it, and there has been some debate over the years on how we actually acquire language. So the question is, how do we actually acquire language? And we can think about language development, and we notice that babies basically take statistics when they're listening, uh, because there's a great uniformity in the pattern of languages that develop across languages and cultures. And basically, um, language acquisition actually starts very early in the womb and um, we start to understand language very early so the baby will listen to the structure and uh, how the language kind of flows uh, parents help that out with what we call something called parent ease where you emphasize uh, various symbols or, or various words for the child um, and you kind of emphasize vowels often and we see this across language across languages and interestingly enough, when, when babies are born, they can babble uh, in every language in the world, and they often hear the sounds in every language in the world. However, they lose that ability as they get older. Now, there's been debate over the years, uh, nature versus nurture. Now, B.F. Skinner, if you remember him, he had the Skinner box. He worked with pigeons, and he did a lot of behavioralist uh, tasks with them. He would argue it was all nurture that you had to learn uh, language by listening to it, so you had to mimic it. However, Noam Chomsky came around and he said it's, it's, it's actually, we have an innate uh, language acquisition device, he called it, a lad. And basically, he argued that kids make up words that parents never say. So if you ever hear a kid say, mom, go to the store, you will never hear an adult say that. Um, so he argued that, no, there is something going on, right? It's not just we have to hear every sound, right? But he also conceded that, of course, we have to be exposed to sounds. So it would probably, it is an interaction of the two, right? To get a developmentally uh, uh, normal language acquisition has to be um, a combination of both uh, the environment and the, the, um, the brain with the language acquisition device ready to receive that uh, language.
Now, uh, people always want to know, do animals have language? And a lot of researchers believe that maybe an, uh, animals don't have full-fledged language as we, we think about it. And we think about that as, a, as unique to humans. However, animals produce noises and there is some debate, and there's a lot of research into it, if these noises actually mean anything or if they can be considered language. Um, and again, uh, animals have used human language. So if you think about uh, gorillas and chimpanzees that they've taught to use language, uh, they don't invent it. They could, they could use uh, sign language. So they've taught um, the primates to use sign language and they communicate with each other and they're able to communicate with the, uh, the humans taking care of them. They, they've even been documented talking behind the humans back uh, about the humans. Uh, so there has been research in that area. We definitely know that animals communicate. Uh, we also know that, that parrots, for example, can mimic sounds in our language. They are not creating language. They're not actually using language. They're just mimicking our language or the sound that they hear. Again, there's no question that animals communicate. The biggest question is, do they actually have a formal language? Um, and if you have any other information, you know any other research, please leave a, a comment down below. Let me know. And um, I think that is it for this video. Like, uh, subscribe, and uh, share. And I will see you all in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.